welcome back to the Villa Filler for our second edition of the Aston Villa podcast brought to you by Heart of the Holt. Today I'm joined by Ollie Mason, Jordan Rye, is that how you say it? Ray. Ray, Ray, Jordan Ray. I've been, I've been called worse at times. Than <laughs> Chris Frysmith <laughs> and Dan Horton. I'm Dan Morgan. And first of all, we're going to talk about Tuesday's result uh, against Barnsley, a 3-1 loss at home. Ollie Mason, what are your thoughts? Just a dire atmosphere again. And nothing went right. We got we 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 got possession and we got players playing fairly well. And yet again, the fans turned too soon. And I noticed that fans were even not celebrating when Codger scored. And you know that's that's the time to stand up and be proud and get them motivated because at that point we had a promising second half lined up. You know, I even tweeted saying this second half could be huge. And it could have been, it could go either one way or the other. We could have gone back and won it, or we could have lost it. And uh, I think you, you sometimes you just got to look at the fans and think, why are you not cheering us when we, we could be straight back in the game? But it was disappointing on all levels. So, not a great night. You know, especially uh, as scoring on the 44th minute, it looked like we were going into half time with something to, uh, to be positive about for once, you know, going 2 0 down to Barnsley is not really what we thought was going to happen but um, talk us through your feelings after Codger's skull Jordan for me that was a big moment Codger gets the goal back and it's at that point in time Roos has got to prove his worth then you've got 45 minutes to change the season he gets the players organises them motivates them gives them a clear game plan and we go on to get something from that you know or even win it that, that changes the season but that said it all to me. There was nothing offered in that second half. He wasn't able to do any of that. And it doesn't give me any confidence going forward, really. A, a massive concern. And the rot doesn't seem to end. Chris, what are your thoughts on the game? 22 shots, 6 on target. What more can can Bruce ask from them, really? I mean, yeah, there's nothing more that he can do. He sends them out there. He gives them a game plan. Uh, it's down to a lack of quality in the final third on occasion. It's down to a lack of quality in the middle of the park. But we've got to get behind them. We can say the result, you know, how disappointing is it? 3-1, we know how disappointing it is. But they're trying. It's just not happening. But there's nothing more that Bruce can do. He's sending them out there. He's giving them a rocket at half-time. You know, it, it's down to a bit of bad luck, a bit of quality. Um, but we are moving forward. The lads are trying. It's just not happening. But absolutely, there's nothing more that he can do. And I'm fully behind him. And this is just a message for the fans, really. You've got to stick behind him. You've got to stay behind the players. When we when we go behind, you need to take a good look at yourselves, really. And, and say, how am I going to contribute to getting us back in this? And the fans have got a massive part to play. And when we are booing when we are just sarcastically cheering our own players you know, just leave the stadium look at yourself and leave because if you're not there to support you need, you need to get out um, every, everyone in this chat knows how, how important the support is but we, we're just not we're, we're not doing it correctly as a fan base we're failing the players they're trying they need our support and we're letting them down and that oh. just really summarises it I think you hit the nail on the head there mate we'll, uh, we'll link your article in the description about the fans and also Dan uh, Wiseman's article, uh, two great articles about the fans. Uh, Dan, what were your thoughts on uh, on the game? Um, I'm in agreement with Chris to a certain extent. I'm fully behind Bruce, and I think everybody should get behind him. I think there's the amount of people, respected people in the game, who say such good things about Bruce and Fulton, and Hull City fans, and everybody. He's obviously a quality manager, so I think we have to get behind him. I think he is partly to blame for Barnsley though I thought we actually played quite well in the first half I don't know about everybody else but for the first 20, 25, 30 minutes I actually thought uh, sorry until they scored I actually thought we played quite well had shots on target looked dangerous in the formation that he'd set up so he deserves credit for that and then we got a goal back just before half time and like everyone said there was a kind of momentum you thought okay second half we're going to come out and we're going we're gonna to go for it but I think the change in formation at half time kind of brought the momentum down and going for Codger up top with Hogan, it kind of 
Kodja was dangerous and he scored his goal from the left wing. So I don't know why we then changed it to go through a different formation that we know doesn't work when we've not got our main holding midfielder in central midfield there to back up a four-man midfield. And we've got two two guys who aren't necessarily proper holding midfielders and can defend properly. There is a two-man midfield. And I just think that's what let us down. Um, but like, like Chris said as well, sarcastically cheering when Grealish went off was a ridiculous thing to do. Um, just insane. I don't know I don't know why people think it was a good idea to, to do that. Sarcastically cheering every time Johnston makes a save. I mean he's he's obviously gonna be our keeper for the full season. It makes it pointless. What can't what confidence does that give these people? So I agree with there was there were some fans that sit next to me as well who are constantly from minute one moaning and moaning and swearing and I just I think that's a wrong message. So I think Bruce is partly to blame for the for the loss for the change at half time in the second half. But I also think I agree we need to give him we need to back him all the way and we need to back the players as well. I think seeing the changes with Codger, seeing him move from out wide up front, as you say, influenced the game. Um, I personally don't think that Codger and Hogan are going to be a very good strike partnership up front. Not 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 good. I just don't think that it's going to work. I can see Chris's face light up. <laughs> I know Chris disagrees with me straight away. But I personally think, like Bruce has said in the press conference, Kodja is better playing out on, on the left. We've seen him score goals from there before. He's not going to be marked as tightly. He's, he's got the free roam. He likes to cut inside and shoot with his, his right foot. So but I, you, know, you noticed it. When he was left wing, he was passing the ball constantly. He was bringing other people into play, and that's when we were most dangerous. He moved exactly. up front, he starts shooting again. Just shoot him and shoot him. Which, I mean, he creates, he scored loads of goals and he's, he's done well for us. But he looks like a proper player, a complete player on the left wing. I, I, yeah, I think on the left, it, the way I see it, the only way we're going to fit in Hogan and Codger in the same system that is going to work is in a 4-3-3 with the Doma on the right, Codger on the left, Hogan up front. We've just paid the best oh. part of 15 million for Hogan, <clears throat> paid 12 million for Codger in the summer so some way or another Bruce is going to have to shoehorn in both of them because we're not going to we're not going to take a loss on them I don't know what you think Ollie no see I like the idea of a 4-3-3 and I do I do think Codger plays better on the left which is a an interesting stat but he he's got everything you want in a striker and I was talking to Chris earlier and it just does it just does frustrate me when he loses the ball and he doesn't go for it back. When you've got players like um, Hogan, who seems to be running 24-7 when he plays, and he'll track down the ball and he'll get it back. But um, Codger out on the left, as Dan said, he, he was on the ball, he was playing people in, and he was fantastic, and he kept running. And it was a different Codger, it was a different player. And you were definitely right in the second half. That changed. I think that's due to his freedom out on the left, as I say, not being marked so tightly. Yeah, they, they don't know what's coming. The, um, by the centre halves, you know, he's is a uh, blistering pace. I can see Chris smiling there. <laughs> I can just see a light going. <laughs> My mum just walked in. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Another Kaja Hogan fan. <laughs> um, but no, I, th- I think the fullbacks of the championship have really got to have got to be wary of Kajo if he's playing out on the wing. Uh, what do you think, Jordan? Yeah, I mean, I was a little bit taken aback by the comments. He's joined in the summer. We should have his best position should be established by now, and it's definitely out on the left. I'm in agreement with you there. And I think what we need to do is we need to find a formation quickly. I agree, four three three is the way to go. I think it suits the players we've got. I think, yeah, g- given the talent we've got there, I think it'll be a well-balanced system, much better than the 3-5-2, 5-3-2 experiment, which hasn't worked. But what we need to do now is stick with that formation so the players aren't confused. I think that's adding to a lot of the problems. We keep changing formations like we did in the previous game. Players are confused. That's causing problems and causing mistakes. So the, the sooner we find the system and stick to it and start applying it, the better, really, and I think the results should follow. It's all about finding a pattern of play. We touched on this last week. Uh, Chris, what are your thoughts on the Codger situation? 
Um, to be honest, lads, I mean, Bruce is experimenting at the moment. So we've got to sort of get off his back a little bit. He's got a group of players who he's starting still, he's still getting to know them. He's still getting to know the formation. So he's going to try different things. Some of them are going to work. A lot of them are going to fail. And unfortunately, when they have failed, we've actually lost games. You can actually try a formation and you could get a point out of it. And unfortunately, it's just not happening. Um, but having said that, give him, you know, let, he will get it right. He will get it right. He's bringing in the players that he wants. We can't be expecting miracles, uh, you know, from this early stage. Stick with him, Kodja. If if he wants to do it as well, he, I mean, he has to want to do it. If he says to Bruce, you know what, I think I'm gonna, I think I'll be better on the left. Bruce isn't gonna turn it down. Bruce is gonna, you know, listen to him and understand that if that's the way that he wants to play and that's the way he's more effective, well, let's go for it. Let's go for it. You know, Hogan, Kodja. Who else is going to go on the right? I don't know. Maybe you could throw him in a dome if we're going to go for a four-three-three. It depends, you know, how we're going to work it. But you know, let's let's give things a go. Um, we are going to get it wrong before we get it right. Um, but the fans just have to understand and be a bit more patient and accepting of what's going to happen. Yeah, I think that's a good point you made there, Dan. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, as I said before, I think Kodja on the left is is the way forward. He seems to like to cut in. I've got no problem with Kodja then if he's cutting in from the left and having a shot because that's dangerous. That's that's where he's most dangerous. Whereas if he's up front turning and having a shot from 40 yards, not as not as dangerous. So I think Kodja on the left with Hogan through the middle, you're going to hopefully see Hogan get into the game more, which I don't think he's been able to at the minute. We seem to keep buying these players who are 12 to 15 million pounds. And apart from Kodja, but... 12 to 15 million pounds who aren't going to create things for themselves and we need to create for them so we need a formation that's going to work with that and going to create some chances for Hogan once we start creating chances for Hogan I think that we'll see him score so I think Codger on the left could could make that happen and could show quite a good partnership between the two and therefore I'd go for it like you guys said the 4-3-3 I'm surprised that especially in the absence of Yedinak we haven't been packing that midfield more I think if Yelinak's there, packing the midfield less is fine because you've always got an anchor. I think in a 4-3-3, if Yelinak's not there, we need to pack the mid- that midfield more so with an anchor there, whoever it's going to be, so that um, Hurahan and Lansbury can play a bit further forward and then get Hogan in. That's the only way Hogan's going to score. But as, as I've said with Codger, I think uh, left wing for me. See what happens. He looked dangerous. He's always looked dangerous from left wing. So, yeah. I think that's a good point you made there about uh, about Hogan getting goals in the midfield. The midfield is is where you know we need to be creating these chances. And uh, a player that we've loaned out to Saint Etienne, Jordan Vertu, uh, joined in 2015 under Tim Sherwood, uh, recommended by Paddy Riley. And boy, I uh, <laughs> weren't happy with that one. Um, but you know, hearing good things about him from the United game, uh, where do you lads stand? on the situation with Jordan Vertu, would you welcome him back to the squad? Would you get rid of him? What would you do? I'd personally welcome him back. I think he looks he looks keen and he actually was playing you know, what from what I saw, I didn't see much of the game. But he did look like he, he played really well. He tried hard and he's he said himself in a I don't know where this was, I saw this on Twitter, but he said himself um that he, he's enjoying it over there. So maybe it will be the le- best thing to let him go if his passion lies elsewhere. Because we don't want any of that again. But um, I think he's a good player. I- I'd put him back in the squad. But who to replace him with, I've got no idea. So, you know, either way for me, to be honest. I can only remember one game where he really put himself about, and that was the Blues game. Uh, I believe he he, kind of, he, you know, he won the ball deep and he instigated the move which created the goal for us. Um, and he looked pretty lively for that game um, but hearing things when he left about um, about the language barrier which is always going to be a struggle but uh, not really speaking a word of English after after you know 10 months for mm. me I I find that a bit disrespectful especially when you're, you're here you live you're working in in the in the UK you you I think I don't know about you lads but you kind of expected to pick up the language I know I appreciate it takes time um, and there was also troubles with uh, his wife who'd just been pregnant uh, and him feeling homesick but I think 
at the end of the day he had the wrong attitude uh, and we're really seeing the, the Jordan Vertu that was linked to the likes of Spurs and Liverpool at his best now out in France what do you think Jordan? Yeah I think I really was really impressed by him in midweek um, I, it's very difficult to judge him based on last season I feel I feel with the poisonous dressing room the bad atmosphere the negativity all around the club we weren't going to see him playing at his best playing at his full potential I feel that given our bad form our bad set of results we don't have the right to turn down a player like that we're not in a position where we can say you're not good enough to play for Aston Villa because clearly he is um, so yeah I would welcome him back certainly would he fit into, into the starting 11 maybe but the game's come thick and fast in the championship so it would definitely be a place for him um, what concerned me a little bit however was uh, his, his comments after the game where he mentioned that no one from AVFC has put the feelers out and got in touch including Bruce but if I was in I, I would be in contact and uh, looking forward to next season and saying that I want him back and I want him to be a part of the team I think he was he wasn't aware that Bruce was watching the game either. Um, yeah, I find that concerning. Yeah, I mean scouting can be done low key, but um, perhaps a bit of notice there. I don't know, but he played as if he knew his his, uh, his employer was watching. I don't know about what yeah. you thought about that, Chris. I don't think he has a future here. No disrespect to him, but I think he's it will be too much time, too much effort to just get him on side. It can be done in a simple conversation with, with Bruce. He can either say, are you up for the fight in the championship? Are you Are going to get kicked? Are you Are going to get knocked about? Are you up for that? And if he hesitates and says, nah, nah, I'm enjoying it here, well then go. You don't, you, don't, you don't deserve to be here. If you're not up for the fight, if you're not willing to put your, you know, your face in, in front of a boot, if you're not willing to get knocked about, this league isn't for you. And I don't think it is for him. I think when it's going well, you can afford a player like him. But at the minute, it's not going well. It's not going to go well for the foreseeable future. Let's say the next six to eight weeks or so, it's going to be a tough period. Um, but there's no point having a passenger here. Too many passengers have come and by this club. We've moved on without him. Um, if he's enjoying it over there, then uh, see you later. No problem. I think you hit the nail on the head there, Chris. Dan, what are your thoughts on this situation? Uh, I mean, I don't, I, I don't think we saw the best of him. He was in a same midfield, well, off, often on the bench, but in a similar midfield uh, with Adrissa Gay, and we didn't see the best of Adrissa Gay in, in a Villa shirt, and he went to Everton and was quality. So I don't think we ever saw the best of Jordan there too. I think he's probably quite a good player, but as Chris said, if you need to be really up for the fight. We don't want people now who are, I don't know, who, who have offers from bigger clubs, but we we give them more money I, I think uh, we need players who are really going to fight to get us out of this championship and I, I'm not sure whether he's that kind of player I don't know whether he's better than Hurahan and Lansbury I, we never really saw enough of him in a Villa shirt so if he's willing to go for it willing to fight and convinces Bruce that he's up for the challenge then absolutely bring him back in because we need players like that if he's not and he's, he'd rather stay in France and he's rather not be at Villa then as Chris said let him go. It's not. It's not a massive, massive thing. I'm Sorry, really... Dan. If he was, if if he was committed, he would have learned one word of English in his time here. If he was really committed to wanting to stay here and be a success here, he would have picked up the language. He would have taken constant lessons, and he would have attempted to communicate with our dressing room with, instead of, you know, letting all that time by and letting some interpreter, you know, speak on his behalf. He would have made the effort himself. Again, his attitude, it just speaks for himself. It speaks for itself. It was poor. Let him go. I think, sorry, just, just to add on that, you know, there are plenty of, of players and managers who don't necessarily have a good command of the language, but, you know, I, I'd still say I'll commit to their clubs. But I do think it's an important point. It, it is a case of having a sit down conversation with him and seeing whether the fight there and the attitude's there. But it's also up to Aston Villa to, to, to get in touch and to put the feelers out and, and you know, to organise that discussion because we don't want to lose a very good player there. So, so that's the danger. He might be a good, he might be a good player, but if he if he just if he doesn't want it if he doesn't want it forget him. He can't, then, he can't we can't be having passengers here, boys. We just can't. We can't. I agree. And uh, he, he, he was he clearly wasn't good enough last season. Otherwise, he would have been in the team, and he was quite often out of it. Um, but at the same time, if he has a conversation with Bruce and and Bruce thinks he's good enough and Bruce thinks he's up for it, then I trust yeah. trust what he thinks and. 
then if he stays then great I'm not sure there's a place in the midfield for the two with us signing Lansbury Hurahan Yarnison we've got Gary Gardner still who I'm surprised wasn't offloaded in January Tishbola, even though yeah. he's been loaned out I think He'll it's come safe back. to say he has a yeah. future at Villa because if definitely he's the kind of player that Bruce likes I think we haven't seen the best of Tishbola. Um and alone we didn't, we didn't see him under Forest. Bruce did we? No. no I think you know see, if he's getting consistent games at Forest, he'll come back and he'll definitely have something to offer as I say I can't see Gary Gardner really being here for much longer um, no. I personally don't see any room for the two in, in our current side um, now next up we've got a bit of beef and no it's not with the Villa view it is uh, <laughs> it is between Steve Bruce and God himself Paul McGrath um, so with, with uh, social media being quite influential on football in the modern day you know it really it changes it changes so many situations we've got Paul McGrath who is a legend in his own right at Aston Villa probably one of our best centre halves ever um, coming out and saying Bruce I don't think he cares enough. Uh, and Steve Bruce then coming back in a press conference saying, uh, "People who uh, who say I don't care, um, that's bullshit, mate." Which uh, fair play, you know. For I, I don't think there was a shadow of a doubt of Bruce not caring. Uh, I think it, McGrath may have meant something else. Um, but what are your thoughts on on this, Ollie? Do you think Bruce cares? I think Bruce, of course, cares. I think this, he has he has had so many challenges in his career, and this is the biggest challenge he will ever have. He's, he has to care. He has an absolutely... It's almost like we're at a massive dead end, and he's got to find a way through a really thick wall. And he's got such a massive job, and without caring, he wouldn't be here, and he'd have walked by now. And, it, and you know many managers wouldn't have taken this job because the amount of pressure from the fans constantly is a hard thing to, to move by, move past and focus. And he's got passion for this club and you can see it. Even though he's been at Blues before and he's had a bit of a past, none of that's relevant. This, this man's definitely the one for me to take us forward because he does care and you can see that in every single interview he's done. Jordan. Yeah, I think of of course he cares. He he has to he, he has to care. You know, he's got he's, he's got a squad that's worth 80, 80 million pounds. It's the biggest club he's, he's ever he's ever going to manage at. So he has to be a success, and therefore he has to care. If it doesn't work out from here, it's it's going to be very bad for him moving forward. So he has to have an incentive to do well. So I do think Paul McGraw is wrong in his comments there. However, I think what Paul McGraw was trying to say, he was talking about the bad results. Maybe he was insinuating tactically the performances weren't that good. Now, we saw Paul McGrath earlier in the season criticise Cod Jeffrey's work rate. I don't know if you remember mm. that tweet. I completely I agree with that, Paul McGrath yeah. in that case. Same yeah. And, but there was, I think there's a difference in terms of how Codger reacted to it and how Bruce reacted to the comments. Personally, I do think when Codger's out on the left, there's a little bit more work rate. So, so I didn't think Paul McGrath was, was totally right on that front as well. But Kodja, he took it on the chin, he responded, he was like, you know, appreciate what you've said, however, you know, I'm doing my own thing, I'll continue to work hard. And it was disappointing to see the way Bruce reacted, really, regardless of, you know, however, which way you think of it, he should have been the bigger man, and he showed a bit of strength to carry it, and a bit of respect for a Villa legend, really. Um, I think it's just a sign that Bruce, is, you know, he is feeling the pressure, and uh, yeah, yeah, just a little bit disappointed. I mean, what would be nice is, given the way our defence has performed, I'd like to see Paul McGrath, you know, work with the Aston Villa defenders. That's what we need to see more of. That mm. commitment, that desire, that passion. I mean, we've all seen the videos, you know, against Italy in 94. You know, that's the sort of desire and the sort of ability we want to see from, from from our defenders at the moment. So I would like to see Bruce be a bit more astute in that situation. You know, rise above it and, and get Villa legends on board, really, which is what we want to see more of. I think you make a very good point there. 
Uh, Chris, we touched on this a bit earlier, off call. Uh, he's a legend in his own right, but uh, he should be staying out of this, shouldn't he? I just want to say, I mean, what a time to make this comment. We just don't need it. It's just another realm of negativity that we don't need to go into. Uh, Bruce knows that this is the biggest task that he will ever ever have if you if he doesn't if anybody thinks that he's not aware of that you need to get your head out of your backside and you need to start looking um, at, you know at how you view football this man knows what it's going to take and he, he's he's prepared for the backlash he's prepared for everything Bruce is the man who puts himself out there every single week for criticism and he says you know what yeah actually I did get that wrong he's one of the most honest men in football um and there is not not many, as Holly said earlier, not many people would touch this job simply because once the fans turn on you, and yeah, again, we're talking about the fans. Once we turn on you, that's it. I mean, you're gone. You're gone. It's very difficult for heads to turn. Um, but yeah, he's take your legend glasses off. You know, Paul McGrath is a legend, but in this respect, he's absolutely dead wrong. Bruce is a man full of passion. The way he controls it, Okay, he might not scream and shout all the time, but he knows exactly what he's doing. He knows the task in hand. Um, I just want to touch on um, something there about quality and passion. Um, when we lose games, a lot of people say there's no passion. You know, we, we were void of passion. Sometimes, you know, you can, you might not be good at something. You might try really hard, but the quality isn't there. So the two aren't mutually exclusive. And at this point, we are trying. It's just not going our way. It doesn't mean that the players don't have any passion for it. It means the quality isn't there. Separate the two because they're not always exclusive. Of course. Uh, That's it, really. This is something we shouldn't you know, really have to be discussing, whether Bruce has the, the passion and desire or not, because as you lads have said, he wouldn't have taken the job. Dan, what are your thoughts on that? I find it a bit odd that Paul McGrath's come out with it. Um, I could understand him criticising maybe... Uh, some performances I can understand him criticising some things that have gone wrong in the game but to to say to say that Steve Bruce doesn't care or in his many words say that I know he didn't quite exactly say that but seems to be what he was insinuating I just I agree I, I just think it's wrong it's, it's not that's it's not helpful um, I think it's a bit undermining and as we said Paul McGrath is a legend of the club and completely is uh, is God to the club but yeah, I, I, obviously Steve Bruce cares. He Even God be can be here. wrong. Yes, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, obviously, he still cares. I find it a bit odd that it's come from Paul McGrath. I mean, they were teammates at United. Surely he sees that, by the way, that Steve Bruce played at United, how much passion he has for the game and how much he cared for them. Um, I don't think any manager would take on a job if they didn't care. And, and Stevie said, I think there would be much easier jobs that Steve Bruce could have taken on than the Aston Villa job if he wasn't going to care about it um, and just just imagine being that manager who was the first good manager since Martin O'Neill that Aston Villa have had imagine how good that would feel so I think that's what Steve Bruce really wants and he's not going to not going to stop until he, until he gets Villa to a successful a successful point again so I think he, he does really care and I think we'll can see I, that Can I just add lads that our chairman would not have appointed somebody who would lose his passion after six months Of course He wouldn't have he wouldn't have appointed him. So anybody thinking that he hasn't got any passion for it, come on, our chairman's a bit more savvy than that, isn't he? Of course. But I also so, think that I also think that if if Bruce had lost that care or passion, then he would have, he would have been sacked, and he, or he correct. would be sacked very shortly. So nah, not for me. It's clear he has passion because he's just walked into a job where, from previous jobs, they're complete rivals. He's come to some fans. He's come hated. You know, Bruce walked in, oh my God, here comes the Birmingham manager. And we're having flashbacks to Alex, Alex McLeish. No, we're not. We've, we've got a, a proven manager. And he's walked in, head held high. When he walked out at um, St Andrews, it was fantastic to see. Because his comments were brilliant. And he walked out and he, he didn't look like he cared about being back there. He had one thing on his mind, and that was drawing or winning the game. And you can tell he has got a passion. And it, it's no doubt that he cares. It's a stupid comment to make. Uh, and finally, um, we've got Newcastle tomorrow. Depending on uh, on when this comes out, it might be today. You'll probably be listening today. 
So in that case, we have Newcastle this evening. Uh, games on Sky Sports. Sports. We'll be looking to break the TV curse. Mm. Um, it's a painful one for, for the fans, really, isn't it? Um, I can't see anything but a Newcastle win. Uh, Ollie, what are your thoughts? I I can see, and I'm always positive, so I can see us actually getting a result. Um, it's just this is a bit of a, a stepping stone for a turning point, and I think as Chris was saying earlier, Bruce will, you know, he'll strum it into them and he'll say, this is what you've got to do, and you you've got to come away with a point or a win, and they will try they will try hard, and I think we will get something. Because I think Newcastle will just be a bit complacent. They'll be thinking they're on a terrible run. You know, we'll just play like we did last week. We'll be fine, and we'll catch them out. I think. Then one thing we've got going our way is injuries that Newcastle have will force Rafa to change, uh, and we know that he likes to change things about a lot. And earlier on in the season, when he's he's he, you know he's playing Jack Colback at left back. Um, We've seen teams just do Newcastle, but I mean, I, w- I wouldn't exactly say they're in bad form, but they're certainly not at the best at the minute. But by that same token, we are not at our best. Um, I think it's more than likely he's going to go with a five at the back, as we touched on earlier. Uh, I personally think a four-four-two uh, would be much more suited, especially if Mila had an X back because. Having him anchoring in, he is the third centre back that then stops the hole. We've mm. got Lansbury, Hurahan, uh, Bjarnason sitting deep, you know, which is a problem. Jordan, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think if we do have a chance, it's going to be 4 3 3 with Yedinak as an anchor. That's the only way I can see us getting anything. In reality, though, I'd, I'd, I just can't. I'd love to see it. You know, I'd love to see us get a result, and that be the turning point. But we've just been outplayed by Barnsley in midweek. You know what I mean? Now we're playing Newcastle, who are most likely going to be champions. The gulf's going to be massive, and we struggled against Barnsley. I just can't see us raising our performance levels to that really. And uh, yeah, I just hope. I just hope the defeat isn't too heavy, and regardless of the outcome, the players. Can, can keep their heads up really I think Bruce will be going there with the idea of we're going to escape with a point if we got three points that would be absolutely amazing but this this fixture is about not losing what do you think Chris? If it was any other bad run you know we're on such a bad run at the moment that he will set up if you cannot win it do not lose it and he will emphasise tomorrow not necessarily the win but do not lose it and he will set up I think it'll be, he'll set up with five at the back I think it will be nil-nil I think we're going to let them have a lot of possession um, you know he, he will drum it in he will be desperate he's a desperate man at the moment he's like I say he's secure in his job no problem but the man is desperate to stop um, this, this losing streak that we're on and he will set up not to lose, not necessarily to win the game. If we win the game, I think it will be through a stroke of good fortune. But I think we'll always set up not to lose. And that's very different than trying to win it. It's definitely about not... Go on, go on. Sorry, I just want to... You know, you mentioned, like, uh, setting up sort of not to lose. Um, I, I do think that's a sensible idea. You, you know, what you don't want is, is a heavy defeat that destroys sort of the last bit of confidence that the players have got. What I would say, though, is that if, if we do concede I just don't want to see panic you know I'm sick of conceding a goal everyone's negative panic mode go and concede two or three more if we do go a goal down just keep your heads keep to the system and it's not the end of the world that's all I want to see regardless of the outcome I just want to see us play our football regardless of whether we get a goal down or not you know that that's not going to happen though you know, know. we go 1-0 down we're gone we're dead in the water so he, yeah. he will make sure he will make sure do not concede yeah. Because I haven't had I haven't had long enough yet with you boys to get your confidence and your mentality to a state that if we go one nil behind, I can get back in it. We will die at one nil, no problem. Do you lads not we think will... we'll we'll treat this like teams have treated Villa Park? Because we we go away and we you know no offence to Championship teams, but we're not going to big stadiums. We're not playing huge fixtures. 
but this is the biggest fixture we'll have away from home. Do you not think we'll go and we'll be this team that teams have seemed to be like Ipswich? You know, full time at Villa Park, they were going over the moon because they treated it like a cup day out. You know, do you not think that we're going to go there and and the lads will have this driven mentality just because we are playing high up in the league and it's a massive clash? No. You don't agree? We've seen because we've done it all before. We we already know this isn't massive for us. This isn't something new. We've done this before. We've been to Newcastle several times. Already in the mentality, we we already know it's a massive game, but it's bigger for Newcastle than it is for Villa from their standpoint because they win, they're cementing themselves for top two, automatic promotion, playoff place. We need to win. We desperately need it, and I think we will buckle under the pressure, but still get away with a point in a nil-nil board draw. Dan, what do you think about that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm going for Villa 1-0 Grealish to score Cup his uh, hand to his ears Sam Johnston to make 22 saves and shush the crowd and then Kieran Clark to get sent off for a headbutt I think in a dream uh, that's the only way it's going to go to be honest no um, I reckon in all honesty we have to now start playing 4-3-3 till the end of the season just go for it we have to pack that midfield we have to make us harder to beat we have to make the midfield harder to just play one ball through and we're just they're in so we have to play whoever's there whether Yednak's there or not we have to pack that midfield otherwise I don't think we've got a chance they will just overrun us if we don't pack that midfield so I want to see a 4-3-3 I want to see um, whether it's Gardner whether it's Yednak someone as an anchor because Gardner played his best football at Nottingham Forest when he was playing behind Henry Lansbury so what I want to see is an anchor, whether it's Gardner, whether it's Yedinak, with Lansbury and Horahan further forward, 4-3-3, pack the midfield, make us hard to beat, as uh, as you guys have said, so that we don't go a goal down early, so that we don't lose our heads, so that we don't start to just play random football and away from the system and just not even necessarily have a go, but be hard to beat, be frustrating for Newcastle because then we can, we can really do something in the game. Um, I think it'll be... A draw. I'm 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 up. I'm optimistic, hoping for a draw or a win. Um, I suppose we'll see, won't we, tomorrow? I'm uh, nervous for the game, but I'm excited to watch it as well. So, hey, we'll see. Well, tomorrow, tom- sorry, Dan. No, tomorrow is the game where where he lines up the players, every single member of his squad, and he says, right, who wants to stay and who wants to go? This is the this is the game. You know, if you want to compete with the big boys in the future, Newcastle, let's face it, they're one of the top teams in the championship at the moment and they will be a Premier League team by the end of this year. If you want to compete against this type of team, I need to see a performance from you. And if you're not going to do it, I'll show you the door, no problem. Yeah, I mean, We've at some to, point, we have yeah. to stop the rot. We have to. And why yeah. can't it? This is a perfect, it perfect it? opportunity. So yeah, and I, th- I think to be honest, our best, some of our best results and performances have come against the better teams. We we played really well against Brighton, um, and yeah, that was a great game. Un- unlucky one all. We played well against Newcastle and, and drew one all. We we played some good football against some of the better teams. So I think we, ha- as I said, we have to stop the rot at some point. We can't say, oh, it's Newcastle. It's okay if we don't stop the rot today because another loss, it's more disappointment. It's it's. It's uh, weakening the confidence of the players, so I think we have to get a good result and then start start our season from now. Definitely. Just just touch, just touching on what you said there, Dan. That if we're going to do what other teams have done to us all season, if we get one chance, we need to take it, and yeah, that's absolutely. where we fail every single time. We never ever take the chance at the right time. To Which score. is why I we think better do if, we, if we play four three three with an anchor and have those two more creative midfielders higher up the pitch and we have Codger let out left and we have another creative player out right, out wide the likelihood is that someone like Hogan is going to get that chance that one chance and you I would put a lot of money on Hogan scoring that chance what I would like to see is um, I definitely see Green start tomorrow I think it's you know he's the only one who's shown heart who's shown commitment and it's been a crumb of comfort so far in this bad run and I think it's if we are going to do well he will have a good game you know his pace his ability to you know cause doubt in the defenders his ability to cut inside I, th- I think he's going to be the key really if we are going to do well and he'll be the sort of wild card in our team 
Green is if we're doing the, if we're doing the four three three, I can't see him starting. That's the only problem because we've got this codger left wing scenario now. Yeah. The problem is where's where's Green going to play? But I think he he's definitely a quality player, and he needs to be on that you know, on that lineup. He's really really good. Yeah. So that has been it for this week's edition of the Villa Filler. Thanks for joining me, Ollie, Jordan, Chris, and Dan. Uh, tune in You're welcome. this time Thank next you. week uh, for another edition. Um, I'm hoping for three points tomorrow, but we'll be Not absolutely hoping. buzzing Definitely. with one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, please like the video, comment your thoughts below, and subscribe for more videos. Uh, this has been us from Heart of the Holt uh, of the Villa. Thank you.